When it comes to 3D modeling and animation, Blender stands as a powerful and versatile tool, offering a wide range of features to bring your creative vision to life. Now among these features, modifiers play a crucial role in enhancing your workflow and enabling you to create complex designs in a non-destructive fashion. Hi there, my name's Hayden from polyfable.com, the place where you learn to bring your stories to life. If you're an aspiring creator, I highly encourage you to head over to polyfable.com. Modifiers are an essential tool in Blender that empowers artists and designers to manipulate and transform objects in non-destructive ways. Modifiers act as a set of instructions applied to a base object. A really good way to think about modifiers are that they are very similar to effects in softwares like After Effects. For example, in After Effects, if you apply a fast blur effect to a layer, that doesn't change what that layer originally had on it. But what it does do is it changes the way that the layer expresses itself within the viewport, i.e. it will blur. The same is true for modifiers. Modifiers do not destroy the underlying data inside your geometry. Instead, they affect it based upon that data. For example, if you add a subdivision modifier, hints in the name, it subdivides, it's gonna add more geometry procedurally to your underlying mesh, but it's not going to change that underlying data. You can still revert back to it should you delete or change that modifier's settings. So think about it in terms of as a set of instructions that will make visible changes to your object, but will not delete the underlying data. Let's explore this in a little bit more detail, shall we? To add a modifier to any object, what you're gonna do is you're gonna to navigate to the modifier properties window. If you're unsure what the properties area is, I highly recommend heading to polyfable.com. There's tutorials about this all throughout the site. Now, let's head over here to the wrench. I like to think of it as wrench, we're modifying something. Then what we're going to do is we're gonna simply press on the add modifier button up here. When we do so, we're gonna be given a large list of modifiers that are split up into four separate categories. You can see those categories names at the top of each column. Modify, generate, deform, and physics. In layman's terms, the easiest way to know what they do is essentially modify, changes the data of the geometry in some way. For example, vertex data, normal data, but it doesn't really change the overall aesthetic of the model. Generate, on the other hand, adds extra data to the model. For example, it could add more polygons in certain areas. That's generally what the generate modifiers do. On the other hand, deform doesn't generate geometry, but it does change what is there. For example, it will change the location of vertices or it will change edge placement, but it will generally not add any more vertices or edges or faces. And finally, we have the physics modifiers. They are a little bit strange. They mostly tie into the physics properties per se, because Blender likes to use the modifier system as a tie-in for other systems. So generally you don't really have to worry too much about these from the modifier menu directly, except for perhaps ocean and maybe even particle instance. Other than that, they're generally not used that often. Oh, and uh, dynamic paint, but again, not used very often. And they are your basic categories. If you would be interested in learning about more of these modifiers in a little bit more detail, please give this video a like as it lets me know and the YouTube algorithm that you enjoy this content and you want to learn more about it. Alternatively, you can head over to polyfable.com where there are articles written up about each of these in detail. Links for all of that will be in the description. Okay then, so let's take a look at creating some sort of 
object using our modifier system without actually doing all that much to the cube, just to show you how powerful the modifier system actually is. First things first, let's add a subdivision surface modifier. What this modifier does is it subdivides the model and because we're using the Catmull Clark method, it is going to then smooth that result out. If we use the simple method, it would stay as its original shape and simply subdivide it in wireframe. So if we head over to our little wireframe, da, 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 we should see, actually let's turn off optimal display, there we go. We should see that it is subdividing our mesh, but I want to keep it on Catmull Clark and increase the levels of viewport and render. Now the viewport and render, they are slightly different. Basically one tells Blender how many subdivision levels does it show in the editor and the other tells it how many it should actually do when it finally comes to render it out. But because we're modeling with it, it actually doesn't matter if the render is different so long as you apply it afterwards. Now then, We've added this, we've now got a sphere-like object from the cube. Remember, if I hide this modifier, we're gonna get our cube right back because it doesn't change the underlying data. So let's now add another modifier, shall we? Let's add a decimate. Now what the decimate is going to do is it's going to triangulate mostly and recalculate the topology to decrease the amount of faces that we have. This is a particularly useful modifier when it comes to creating LODs for games, such as the Godot game engine or Unity or Unreal. I find that the Blender's Decimate is probably one of the best decimation tools out there, uh, even when we look at Mesh Labs or other very useful softwares. Blender's Decimate, in my opinion, just comes out on top most of the times. Um, so I'm decreasing the ratio here to create something along the lines of this. Let's now add a wireframe modifier. This is going to turn all of our wires into actual physical tubes, essentially. I can then increase or decrease the thickness of said tubes via the modifier here. Remember, this is but still a cube. I haven't changed the cube data. If I was to change if I was to hide all of these modifiers, I would still end up with the Blender's default cube, which, you know, it's kind of ironic in a way. I haven't deleted the default cube yet. <laughs> and that's one of the first things to go usually. So we've added the thickness modifier and now let's make this look a little bit more pretty by adding in another subdivision surface modifier. This is going to help us smooth out that result a little bit further and create an alien-like effect. Like so. Perfect. Another thing that we can do as well now is we could potentially add in a build or what am i thinking a remesh modifier and decrease the voxel size to get a bit more of a smooth result let's do shade smooth and turn on smooth shading in our remesh modifier wonderful Now I could add in a sphere into the center like so, but again, I wanna keep this all in modifiers. Now, I don't wanna go into great detail about geometry nodes because they are a whole other subject. I do encourage you to subscribe and ring that bell button because I do have an upcoming video on getting started with geometry nodes in the next couple of days. But let's now just add a very simple geometry node system, new, add sphere again i'm not going into great detail about this you'll have to wait for the next video which i will put into this description when it releases about geometry nodes i'm going to add a new uv sphere into the system 
and let's add in a join geometry and add in the UV sphere, decreasing the radius like such. Let's also move this below for neatness sake. Let's change our normals to set shade smooth on the sphere. Perfect. So essentially what we're doing in here is we've got our input geometry. It is being joined with a procedurally generated UV sphere, which is then setting itself to shade smooth so that it can use the smooth. And then it is being output to the geometry node modifier. Again, this is a cube. This just goes to show how powerful Blender's modifier system truly is, especially with the advent of the geometry node system. Again, not going into great detail. This is not the purpose of this video, but should this video receive enough attention, I will make a follow-up going into further detail about all of this. But I wanted to showcase just how complicated geometry you can create from a simple cube. Let's just make this a little bit more pretty now, shall we? Let's go into our shading tab. Let's go to new. And let's create maybe a metal on here, shall we? Let's increase the metallic, decrease the roughness, like so. Perfect. As you can see, that sphere is not affected. That's because we haven't set its material. We'll head back over to geometry nodes. And then I'm just gonna add a material, new material, we'll call this one glow. And then we'll pop down emission, change emission to be blue and increase its strength to let's say 10. And then within the geometry nodes, I'm just simply gonna do set material because I believe that there is an issue with set material index for now. Uh, and we'll say glow in here such as that. So now we should see that it is going to glow, which is exactly what we want. Uh, let's also change it to add a bit of bloom in here. And we can of course change our strength a little bit further. Maybe let's go to, uh, I don't know, 50. There we go, that's nice. As you can see, this is one object, one cube that is doing all of this. The modifier system allows you to create incredibly complex stuff. Now, do you and should you use it for everything? Absolutely not. It is very useful if you know that you're going to be doing the same thing over and over and over again. But if you're just making a one-off piece, I would just recommend modeling it out and using the base modifiers just to assist you for certain operations. Wouldn't even get into geometry nodes at all for that. Okay, so now that we've got our model like this, what if we wanted to now set it so that it is actually editable? Because currently, if we pop back into edit mode for this object, we will see that it still is a cube. We only have eight vertices that we have under our command. Uh, now, naturally, we could technically move it around as such, and that is going to change the effect somewhat. But let's say we want to actually set this in stone so that we can actually start editing destructively, which is not as bad as it sounds. Destructive and non-destructive editing, they're just coin terms made up. They're both good. So don't let the names fool you. They're both perfect. It's just where you use them that makes them either good or bad. So let's now apply this. That's how we're going to set this. Now we could go through each of these modifiers starting from the bottom and working our way up using the apply key here, but I don't recommend doing that, especially if you want to apply all of them. What you can do instead is you can simply right click with your model selected and choose convert to mesh. This will convert everything to a mesh again, even though it is a mesh. I'm just going to duplicate this to showcase it. Right click, convert to mesh. As you can see, the modifier list has emptied and we now have access to all the vertice data that we would otherwise not have access to in the original. One thing to also note about modifiers is the order in which the modifiers are added is just as important. Again, going back to the After Effects analogy. For example, let's say you add a blur to 
a layer in After Effects. And then after that blur, you add in a posterization effect. The posterization is going to take into account the blurred result. However, if you put the posterization effect before the blur, then the blur is going to blur the result of that posterization, which is exactly how the modifier system works in Blender. The resulting modifier is going to be calculated, and then the next one is going to be calculated on the result of the original. And that's going to propagate all the way down our list to the end. So, for example, if we didn't have a subdivision, as you can see, it doesn't work anymore. We can then have our decimate, remove the decimate, and there it is. That's because the wireframe is the one being calculated next. If I added that subdivision again, as you can see, it's going to take a lot longer because the decimate is no longer decimating the subdivision result. So the wireframe has a lot more to do now to the point where it potentially might crash Blender, but it won't, thankfully, which is why it's always important to make sure that your order is properly stacked. This is not something that you're just going to learn out of the gate. It's going to take time and practice. It's not something that I can impart upon you, but it is something that I can impress upon you so that you do take notice of it. Now, as you may have seen there just before when Blender stopped responding for but a moment, while modifiers can enhance your creativity, too many of them, or in the wrong order, can slow down Blender's performance considerably. So be mindful of the impact on your system's resources and only use the modifiers that you absolutely require. And if you know that you no longer will need to modify any of the values, consider applying them to make them real. That way you are not dealing with recalculating modifiers. I hope that this video has opened up the world of possibilities for you in regards to using modifiers in your work. They really allow you to create intricate designs while preserving the integrity of your original models. Modifiers exemplify the power of non-destructive workflows. And as you delve deeper into this realm of modifiers, remember to experiment, explore, and push the boundaries of your creativity. Again, if you're a creative who's looking to tell stories with Blender or other softwares, I do highly recommend heading over to polyfable.com. I've set out quite the course and levels that don't assume that you know things within the software industry and will take you on a fairly robust journey to enhance your creative storytelling capabilities within the software space. This is Hayden Falzon from polyfable.com. Signing off.